Welcome, everybody, to another session of Logicals in Quarantena. On behalf of the Brazilian Logic Society and the Logic Interest Group of the Brazilian Computer Society, I'd like to thank very much Professor André Villavessis, who kindly accepted our invitation. André, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, I, I guess you can see a presentation. I, I don't, I cannot see, for some reason, I cannot see here the... Uh, we can see it. The people, yeah. I just uh, wanted to see if I can... Uh, Open a kind of parallel session in the in the tablet, so that I I can uh, you know kind of follow if there is some kind of you know like uh, people making and okay anyway so our topic today is going to be a kind of very classical topic completeness and uh, the connection to reconstruction reconstruction problems of uh, what to, to reconstruct well reconstruct syntax of a logic and uh, completeness so we will go through some very classical flavor of completeness and then some very modern flavors of completeness that uh, we, we will have. So uh, I'm just trying to join from the second session and uh, so let me just remove all noise, hopefully. And uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, so we're in kind of in between uh, logic and topology. This is somehow the... Uh, the idea here, for some reason, yeah, I cannot see what, uh, okay, Can, yeah. So our topics today are really reconstruction of syntax from semantics, first of all, that is, uh, uh, okay, work, you know, going uh, classically to Marshall Stone, and then reconstructing syntax from semantics in a modern, in a more more modern way by Mackay and Lurie. I will describe a little bit uh, what they look for, and uh, then some dualities that uh, I think uh, would be uh, kind of important. So the main theme here may be described then as reconstruction. So this is not just a theme, you know, of logic or uh, of, uh, but. It is really a theme common to many different mathematical situations, reconstruction. You know, for example, we have reconstructions of varieties from their homotopy groups. That's a very important part of, uh, you know, many uh, big uh, projects and many big areas of mathematics are really about what kind of uh, information can you get about a variety from its homotopy group. Or reconstruction of theories or by interpretability classes, and this is much closer to our heart if we are logicians, of models from their automorphism groups. I want, I have um, something to say about this. There are some very interesting things that are actually connected to with uh, what uh, we will see, but this is something kind of more technical that I men may mention at the end. In any case, in the second situation, so when you want to reconstruct a theory, or maybe you are more modest and want to reconstruct just uh, by interpretability class of a theory uh, from, the automorphism group of uh, models of, uh, of the theory, uh, an important part of the reconstruction is capturing the topology of the automorphism groups from the pure algebraic structure. So there is some kind of intermediate step between the algebraic structure, the group, the logical structure, the theory, in between you have topology. And topology plays a key role in the reconstruction. So we will look a little bit at a very classical situation, uh, you know, Marcel Stone here, is the the guy here in the in the uh, black and white photograph? This is maybe from I don't know from where, but uh, his theorem is certainly from from the 30s. Then you have Mackay in the big photograph. He somehow brought all these ideas to the categorical world much later. And this is you know the one in the bottom is Jacob Lurie. He's uh, you know researcher professor at uh, the Institute for Advanced Study, and he, he normally is seen as a, an algebraic topologist. He's very famous uh, as an algebraic topologist. However, in 2019, he wrote a paper about the completeness theorem that very much inspires some of the story I want to tell you today. So, in a way, they're all, they're all looking at uh, something co uh, connected to Gödel's completeness theorem or to other completeness theorems, and I will try to describe this in a, in a, and to recast this in a way that is perhaps less familiar uh, to some of you. So anyway, Stone, Mackay, and then Lurie in 2019 achieve exactly recovering syntax from semantics, but in three different contexts. So before 
kind of a plunging into notation and everything, the result of the problem, you have semantics and you want to recover somehow the syntax and how can you recover the syntax from the models? So in a way you have all this kind of network between model theory, category theory, and there is Stone kind of a, in the classical part in the middle of all these things, Mackay and Nuri in a more kind of category theoretical world. And there is a role of topology in all this. So let us now start. Let us now revisit a very classical theorem, albeit uh, I will do it with a somewhat uh, you know, modernized language. So the ideas here are a mixture of uh, Lavier, Mackay, Reyes, Lurie, but I will use the notation uh, that Lurie used in his paper, Ultra Categories, where he does, you know, his main aim, it's a very long paper, where his main aim is to prove a complete theorem. So let us go back to stone duality. Stone duality is something that, uh, you know, people know from topology courses or, or maybe heard about. It is something that is usually thought of as something kind of, kind of remote from logic. But let us look at the stone theorem. So we have a Boolean algebra. This could be, if you have a logic, this could be the Lindenbaum algebra of the logic or the logic of, uh, you know, of uh, how, you know, conjunction and injunction somehow form your Boolean algebra. And then you have, on the other hand, it's spectrum, spec B, a topological space. So the to that topological space is really, so the spectrum is really the set of all homomorphisms of Boolean algebras between the original Boolean algebra B and the trivial Boolean algebra 0, 1. So if you take all homomorphisms, that's where you get the spectrum. And uh, well, B alg is a category of Boolean algebras whose morphisms are Boolean algebra homomorphisms. And on the topological side, well, this collection of homomorphisms, they're all maps from B into 0, 1. So it is a subset of the uh, topological product, the, the Cartesian product of uh, 0, 1. So it has a topology but just taking you the product topology of, uh, you know, of zero one. So the set of all functions from B into zero one has uh, its natural topology and spec B are all those functions that are homomorphisms that is a subset of the large product that we have here. Therefore, it inherits in a natural way the, you know, the topology from, from the big product topology. Now, the key issue is that this topology depends functorially on the Boolean algebra B. So if you start moving the Boolean algebra along morphisms of Boolean algebras, you kind of get a reflection of, uh, of that um, uh, shift in the Boolean algebra side in the topology. So that's a good beginning. You have duality between algebra and topology, classical duality here, 1936, really, you know, almost one century uh, old. We have the, the construction from B to spec, you know, changing a Boolean algebra B to its spectrum really determines what is called a fully faithful embedding from uh, the category of Boolean algebras. You have to, you know, take the inverse uh, arrows in that category and top. And the essential image of this functor is the full subcategory of the topological spaces that are called stone spaces. So these stone spaces are, well, the, the objects of that category are stone spaces that is compact, Hausdorff, topologically, to totally disconnected, uh, well, topological is kind of repeated here, to totally is connected to topological spaces. So when you look at that subcategory, you get, uh, you know, uh, a full uh, duality with the Boolean algebra category. And in a way, this can be read through our eyes, our logician's eyes, as an equivalence between syntax and semantics in propositional logic. When you have propositional logic, so we are at a very basic level at this point, propositional logic, we kind of uh, can see this duality already in this stone duality theorem. So normally uh, this completeness uh, and the equivalence between syntax and semantics in propositional logic is kind of a, at, at least, you know, in model theory, it's kind of bypassed very fast. We go to, well, we go to first order logic, we go to predicate logic, where we also have this equivalence between syntax and semantics. But there, things are perhaps a little bit less visible. And I would like to take this kind of a stance that, uh, you know, being in this kind of more primitive uh, area of logic may give us some interesting information. So how do you see, how do we view Stone's theorem as a kind of completeness theorem? So as I said before, this provides 
an equivalence between the syntax and semantics of propositional logic in the, in the following way. On one side, you have a propositional theory, TB. It gives, you know, it is connected to the Boolean algebra. And on the other hand, you have models of TB, which are essentially those homomorphisms that uh, were the elements of the spec of B. So models in the propositional world are really just those homomorphisms. They're very, you know, simplistic models, but in a way that's uh, what happens at, at that level. And that's already rich enough for what we want. So the theorem essentially implies that every Boolean algebra may be reconstructed from a combination of two data, the collection of models and also the topology. So let us look a little bit at how, what do I mean by this reconstruction? Because although this may feel very classical to some of you, this is what Lurie, well, first Mackay and uh, people around Levere and uh, Regis uh, in Canada, and then, uh, and then much more recently Lurie in his world where he's looking for this sort of duality for, for algebraic topology, uh, uh, it's happened. But let us look at, so I, I, I'll go very quickly over this. This is the same idea, but I, I, I'll go back to this, to, to Mackay later. So there will be also, also an equivalence of categories, but let us skip this for now. And let us look at the classical construction. So, in, and this, you know, in order to catch better what Mackay and much later Lurie mean, it is worth recording some cl classical constructions or more classical constructions the stone check compactification and filter products. We will go back to these two classical constructions. But I will use Lurie's notation in his paper. Maybe it is not his. Some people here might correct me, but I like his notation. You will see in a moment why it is really useful. So let us recall the stone check compactification of a set. It is, so you start from a set, you go to a topological space, you can compactify a set by just taking the spec of the power set of S, which is a Boolean algebra. All the definitions are subsumed into what we had before. The points of uh, beta S of this spectrum, that is the homomorphisms uh, that we had, are known other than our old friends, ultra filters over the set S. So if you are more used to, you know, to seeing the definition of stun check compactification as a set of ultra filters, well, you can recover it this way, of course. And I say it's here, here, as I said before, they correspond to Boolean algebra homomorphisms from the Boolean algebra of, uh, you know, the power set of S as a Boolean algebra in the usual way, so, uh, way. and again, the Boolean algebra 0, 1. And you use mu because they are ultra filters and we know you know we know in secret that ultra filters are really measures uh, in some sense now there is a very important ultra filter that i will call the dirac delta ultra filter for every point in s for every s in s that dirac delta ultra filter that we also call the principal ultra filter but let us think of it as a function so it's like a dirac delta it is really the homomorphism that uh, you know, just, uh, in, um, you know, for, for any set uh, inside S, uh, the value is one if the element S, little s, belongs to I, or if it is zero, if it doesn't. So you have, that's a homomorphism, you can check it is a homomorphism, and it is really concentrated, it's like the measure concentrated exactly at the point S, or in another lingo, the ultra filter, the principal ultra filter at S. But we want to think of this as a Dirac function, as a Dirac delta function. In some sense, it might be useful because we will want to integrate it. We will see why. So the Dirac function, now I collect all of these Dirac deltas, and there is a Dirac function delta from S to beta S that for each S provides you this delta sub S that was the Dirac, the Dirac function, so it was a ultra filter or um, uh, a homomorphism that uh, I was given before, concentrated in S, and so we now we you know we take globally this Dirac uh, delta function, and uh, well in basic topology, um, beta S is taught as you know the universal compactification of S in the following sense: if, you, if X is an arbitrary Hausdorff compact space, and F from S to X is some function, any function no uh, requirements on, on, on f, well, there exists a unique continuous function, uh, f bar, 
going from the topological space, beta S, that was the spectrum, all the ultra filters, all the homomorphisms, into X. Uh, so that there you have topology on the right hand side. So this makes sense. It's a continuous function that makes the diagram commute. And it is the, the only one that is continuous and makes this diagram commute. So one can, ref, you know, this basic uh, theorem. Sorry? Yeah. Um, do you want questions in the middle or at the end, Andres? I will stop for, for questions in a moment. Maybe at the end of this. The, yeah, yeah, maybe. But no. No, I, I changed my mind. Uh, go ahead. Ask ask a question right now, uh, Valeria. Well, I, I am kind of a little bit confused because, you know, the Dirac function is definitely, uh, I mean, it, I thought it was the only non-continuous function that I knew. So I'm kind of a little oh. bit... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, this, uh, um, I mean, the, the reason I call this Dirac function here, following Lori, by the way, is just because you're kind of putting together so the discontinuous function here is the delta s as we had before so this is a very discontinuous function in some sense that's the direct one direct function but now you put together all the possible wax and delta is the change that uh, you know for each s gives you the direct sub s and this function is con uh, well this function itself is not continuous because there is no topology here in s the one that is continuous is this uh, uh, f bar that goes from the from the spec from the beta of s into x. So this is a way to define the you know the categorical way one could uh, look for this universal property. And uh, this actually you can do it that way. You can go for the universal property in the category, but we re request continuity. And the solution to that is this delta that in itself is neither continuous nor discontinuous because it is just changing something from the category of, of, uh, of sets into the category of topological spaces. So this is what, just a name of this function. But let us, you know, in, a, uh, you know in, in distributions, one uses the derived functions to integrate. So let us take an integral. So let, we can take the, integrate, the integral of a function f from s to x, an arbitrary function, Remember, this function here was completely arbitrary with respect to ultra filter. So we start with an arbitrary function. We're going to take the, its integral now, now that we have an ultra filter. Uh, well, this will be essentially we compute this f bar at mu. So remember f. So let me go back to this diagram. We had f, and then we have the delta that uh, for each one of the points of s. Is giving you the kind of measure that is concentrated at S, that is the Dirac at S, and uh, the classical stone uh, construction, stone check construction, gives you this way of moving from beta S to X. Well, now if you select any measure here, any ultra filter, not necessarily one of these Dirac ones, but any ultra filter, you can compute its value. So if you take a mu here, you can compute its value by f bar, and when you do this computation, you're in, in a way taking some sort of average along what the way this measure concentrates, you know, uh, depending on the original function f that uh, had the main s. So in a way, we're integrating uh, over all s along the measure mu. Now, let me go to the next slide. One thing that is important is that this, this first line tells you that this makes sense. So the integral, if you take an arbitrary function and you take uh, the integral with respect to the Dirac function at a, fun at a point t, well, it is concentrated at t. So you should recover the value at t. Well, this is something that uh, people in, uh, you know, in set theory usually know uh, just in terms of a uh, principal U2 filters, but they like this notation. I think so. Let's wait a few minutes, a few seconds. Hope not minutes. I'm 
Andres, can you hear me in any of the accounts? It looks like I have frozen. Yeah. For okay, how long now I can hear you. This frozen. For how long was this uh, frozen? Uh, maybe 30 seconds. Okay, okay. Yeah, I got uh, uh, Valeria's message on the on the other screen, which was really helpful. Because okay, so let me again share the screen. Okay. Okay. So I was discussing this uh, integral, and I was just saying that uh, in the first line here, uh, one recovers something that one would expect. If you take an integral with respect to a measure that concentrates in one point, in the point t, you should recover the value of the original function at t. And this is exactly what happens in this first line. One can, you know, do the computation through, you know, going running all this Stonecheck uh, uh, theorem. But this is what happens. So the idea is you can use Stonecheck as a way to define this integration of an arbitrary function uh, by you know now when you select an interesting measure that you want to that you want to, to understand somehow some some mu well you go to to this diagram that we had before you t you pick mu on this side on, on beta s and you compute its image through the unique f bar but this you know, this, so the uniqueness kind of uh, allows us to use a symbol like this. And uh, yeah, what they say here, every function f from a set s into a Hausdorff compact space x may be integrated with respect to a ultra filter mu. And this produces just an element in x, as one would expect. I mean, the original function was into x. The integral is also into uh, an element in x. Now, the first thing I discussed. When you integrate with respect to the trivial measure, that con the Dirac measure that concentrates in, a, in, a, in the point t, you should get the value of t. And this is very much like uh, what we expect from a Dirac function. But there is also the fact that now if you move mu along beta s, you're moving in a topological space, then you can ask, how does this value depend? And it depends indeed continuously. It's a kind of a nice exercise in basic topology. But there is more. Now, if f from s into x is some function that happens to have a dense image, then actually you can recover the topology of x from the data, how you know mu changes into its integral by, the, by this. Well, this is kind of more complicated. This is still part of the classical stone uh, uh, and stone check uh, theorems. The reason, the topological reason, is that any continuous function between Hausdorff spaces is a quotient. I won't go into the topological details of this, but the kind of more information theoretic or logical content is that it can actually recover topology of X from these two data, which is from the data of how uh, the the integral depends on the original measure. So let me just try to summarize here and uh, maybe start the first discussion at this point. So we have some sort of coding going on here. From f, which was, remember, an arbitrary function from some set and mu and, uh, and uh, some topological space that was in some nice category, Hausdorff. Uh, do you follow me? Can you confirm? OK. Great, thanks. Uh, from that f and from the measure, you can actually, well, and, and the way you compute, you know, the value of the integral with respect to that measure, uh, from what I, I saw before, we may recover the topology of x. Now, let me, before going into a more general uh, discussion, I think this is, it is worth stopping here and maybe, uh, discussing a little bit of what uh, is going on here at a more general level. So I will stop presenting for a second and engage some discussion here, because what we have here is this situation where we have three categories or, or two categories, one algebraic one and one topological one. And there is always the problem of how we can reconstruct information about the original category from another category. And one could 
look at you know you can study this question as a purely mathematical question in the sense you know like what people do uh, when they study varieties for instance and they try to recover them from their pi one or their um, you know their homotopy groups or some other uh, geometrical invariants and usually one does not see that as a kind of a very logical phenomenon or at least not on the face of it however on the other hand i one can uh, translate that phenomenon as I, as I did in the beginning of the of the lecture as a question of how much can one recover about a theory by knowing perhaps not you know something as complicated as the you know the fundamental group there is no fundamental group normally but maybe just the category groups yeah, Hausdorff and Boolean algebras. Yes, yes, yes. The, uh, yeah, I have in the chat this question by Valeria. Those two categories, and how can one, rec you know, recover information about the other category? And one, you know, in a way that looks also like a very information theoretical question. But then logic kind of uh, becomes very natural, as you know, and as people uh, in, in also in logic connected to computer science know quite a lot that uh, this kind of more information theoretic question can be uh, put, you know, can be discussed. Now, there is one, maybe I'd like to uh, now share the, the other screen, the, the screen from the from the tablet, I think. Uh, uh, although, let's see, it's, yeah, is it, yeah, it is possible to share the screen from the tablet. Uh, please confirm when uh, the, the screen will be shared we can see okay because there is a problem and there is the related problem that i want to discuss in the end and in connection to this let me give you a very naive problem first you're given a model m think of m you know let me, let me think of a model as an extremely simple thing you are giving this sort of model something like this you know, a hexagon or some kind of polygon or something like that. Of course, our models in model theory are slightly more complicated than this. And then for some reason, I, you know, I hide the model. So I now hide the model, but I show you something like the symmetries of M. So in, a, in our lingo, this would be, you know, odd, the automorphism group of M that would be really the symmetries of M. You may also change the kind of category where you want to look at the symmetries, and that's what people do in geometry. They look at very specific kind of uh, automorphisms or, or, or groups connected uh, to M, like pi one, for instance, or other groups. So in this case, in this kind of very naive situation, if I give you symmetries of M, perhaps you can recover it because M is already a very symmetrical object, and then you'll have you know all the uh, rotations and all the reflections and so on. So I give you that probably with a little bit of time and patience, you could recover or say, oh, M was a hexagon. That's kind of a, but in a, in a more, you know, sophisticated situation, maybe M is some kind of complicated finite model, some kind of a, you know, really complicated database, maybe some huge database. And the symmetries of M may be much less visible than this. Or M might be, you know, some model of the theory of the reals with some, you know, exponentiation or something like that. Or it may be a model of set theory, you know, maybe a model of ZFC or a fragment of ZFC, or it may be, you know, many other. And then what kind of information do you recover from odd M? So can when can you go back to this way? And the trivial answer, the kind of fast answer is normally you cannot do anything. Normally, uh, odd M is too weak to allow you for reconstruction of M. So what kind of information do you need additionally to be able to reconstruct M? Now, there is a longer history that normally you don't quite recover M, but you recover, if you're really lucky, the theory of M. That is a much weaker for I think than recovering M because theorem, theory of M could ha have a lot of different models. And this may happen, so this may happen when the theory of M, you know, may, may, may recover the theory of M if M is very homogeneous and very saturated. So if M has a lot of 
automorphisms, then you have a chance of reconstructing something from the automorph automorphisms of M. Now, in real life, uh, so more often, you do not even recover the theory, but you do recover the bi-interpretability class of M. You do recover the bi-interpretability class of M in many cases. Uh, the key part to, rec to, to recovering it is that the automorphism group of the model that is already, you know, a very kind of a specific model. So if the automorphism group has a topology that can be recovered from the algebra, the technical word for this is usually something along SIP property, the small index property. So when it has something called the small index property that uh, I want to find right now, then you can actually go back to his reconstruction and you can go back and recover the whole uh, by interpretability class of M. This is a much weaker invariant than the theory of M. You can have a lot of uh, 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 models that are by interpretable whose theories are still different. But being able to recover at least the by interpretability class of M, I think is a very uh, nice uh, target. When you can even recover the theory of M, you're in a really good shape. When you can recover M, you're in the extreme case, like in this you know, situation where you can recover because M was already very simple and its automorphism group was kind of rich in this case. So that's kind of an, an ideal situation that we almost never have. But in logic, we can somehow recover these two things, the theory of M and the bi-interpretability class of M. By the way, the uh, way one recovers those is is very entangled with the complexity of these of these classes in in, a, in purely stability theoretic terms. There is a stability theory hierarchy that comes, you know, that, uh, so so people often know some layers of that uh, hierarchy, like the stable theories or like uh, all minimal theories are, you know, a little bit beyond the stable theories. For those, you have um, a lot of uh, uh, tools that enable you to uh, actually do this sort of a uh, um, or enact this sort of a recovery of information of the original class. Now, maybe before going to the so in the second part, I don't have much time, but I want to show you a little bit of the constructions that are uh, doable by using this Lurie notation, the kind of ideas that somehow get uh, started by changing the notation of the familiar into something unfamiliar. So we will. We, I, I can show you that uh, you have all these integrals, then you have Fubini-like uh, situations, and you have a lot of uh, kind of. You, you start taking these integrals, logical integrals, in a serious way, and it goes very far. It goes as far as Lurie's work in a algebraic topology. But before that, maybe this is a good time for questions on this before kind of uh, projecting into the the more unknown uh, part. In the present, so maybe if you if you have some comments or questions on these categories or or on these by interpretability results. Should I go uh, ahead? I think there are no questions by now. Excellent. Okay, so I will now go to um, the you know the other presentation. Okay. Good. Okay, so we were at the point of this coding. So let us continue a little bit of this sort of translation. Um, before I state a little, you know, some, of, some of the, uh, you know, I give you some of the statements of Mackay and Lurie. So this duality that we had between uh, first, the, you know, the two categories, that was the, uh, you know, Boolean algebras and the, the stone, the stone, the stone category uh, that corresponded to predicate calculus has been generalized in many different ways. So let us, you know, kind of uh, build our way to our there. So let T be a theory or in a small pretopus if you want. And let's take a collection of models of T with indices in a set S. So we build the ultra product of the models by ultra filter mu as before. 
by this. So given a family of non-empty sets, a ultrafilter mu over s gives you an equivalence relation on the product, where two sequences in the product, two elements in the product, xs for s in s and ys for s in s, are mu equivalent if and only if, remember that mu was a homomorphism into zero one, the um, value of mu on the set of all uh, indices where they coincide is equal to one. Of course, this means in, uh, in, in the usual sense that th this would belong to the ultra power. So the ultra product is just take the product and divide by this equivalence relation. And we can call it the integral of ms along mu. So we're integrating all these models along the measure mu. So far, this might seem like some kind of fancy, you know, a notation for something that is uh, well known, but let us now iterate integration. So, and let us look at the construction in a kind of, in a kind of more general way. The first important point is that if you fix a ultra filter in beta s, the construction here that uh, changes, you know, that uh, starts from a collection of, of models and uh, gives you the integral of the models with respect to the ultra filter mu. So this given into filter mu in beta s is functorial. This gives you a functor, and the functor, I call it integral here. Uh, the, so the changing, you know, depending on, on the input of the functor here would be collections of moles of t into moles of t. And it is functorial in the, in, in, in the natural way. Now, all of these functors, they come along with two natural transformations that link them and that are the key to something called the ultra structure of the category mod t. And one can ask what was really at work in doing this ultra structure. But before this, let us ask about this situation that they call ultra fun, ultra functor. So let f be a functor between two categories, an arbitrary functor so far. Of course, people in category theory know that one requires some uh, uh, you know, some closure on the category theories, uh, on the categories to for, for this to make sense. But a ultra structure would be then a family of isomorphisms. So you have a whole family of isomorphisms between the image of the integral and the integral of the image here. So that means you take the functor you compute, and compute it in the ultra power, ultra product of all these uh, structures. And when is that the same as taking the ultra product of the images of, uh, of, the, of the structures by the functor? So with the indices in collections and ultra filters, so this is you know, the, the real structure that is being built here. And the ultra functor is then a functor that has uh, ultra structure on top of it. Now, uh, so before looking at the Mackay statement, let us dig a little bit deeper in the properties of ultra filters and ultra functors in categories. So first of all, we may build objects in like this in a category whenever it admits at least product and small fiber collimates. Uh, for those of you who are, who are um, experts in category theory, there is an interesting exception. There are many categories that don't have product, but that do have objects that, be, uh, that behave like ultra products. And that's an interesting situation that is kind of, uh, I don't really discuss it here, but Clearly, if you have products and limits, you can follow this definition. And following this definition, you can actually then build what is called the categorical ultra product along the measure. So now you start kind of placing yourself in a more general category. It could be a category of models, a topos, or it could be some other category that enables you to do this sort of construction, which is a mixture of taking, at least in this definition, it is a mixture of taking products and being able to take collimates in a in a and fibered collimates really in a nice way. Let, let me just show two uh, constructions without going to, into the details. The details here look a little bit um, um, complicated. The first one is just uh, some kind of a, a isomorphism into you know if, if you take the Dirac if if, if you take a little product where the measure is concentrated in one point, you should recover the original uh, model. In a categorical theoretical way, this is done via some uh, epsilon uh, morphism. But perhaps it's more interesting to ask yourselves what happens if you take two integrals in, in, a, in a different order, like in the Fubini theorem. 
So when do we have something like a Fubini theorem? Now here, because we're taking ultra products, the situation is slightly more complicated. We have to take a collection of you know models with uh, of objects with indices uh, in 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 T in some set T, and then you have a whole collection of measures, a whole collection of ultra filters with indices in some S. So you can ask yourself, okay, now let me take the integral the of of the ultra filters. These are structures, so I can actually integrate all of them. And this is kind of taking the average of all these ultra filters. This gives me one measure, one ultra filter, and I can ask what happens if I take now the integral of my collection of models and t along this average measure. Is it the same or is it not the same as first taking the integral of each one of these models by each one of, you know, of, of all of these models, sorry, over each one of these measures, and then allow the measures new s to change along s, you know, according to the measure mu. So, of course, this is a situation where you have two different uh, uh, order in a uh, different uh, order of integration. And, uh, well, in, in, in the case where we are, one can prove that there, is, that there exists something called the Fubini transform that gives us essentially this, uh, this situation. So, the, well, there are situations where, where this happens. I think uh, we're running short of time. What I wanted to uh, do, rather than uh, you know going to the details here, was kind of illustrate some of the tools that are enacted by all of this here that uh, start mixing a flavor of um, set theory, certainly. There is a lot of set theory kind of uh, lurking behind here that people in set theory will recognize in many different ways. Of course, one could think of this in terms of a large cardinal embeddings and measures and uh, if one wants. There is a lot of category theory kind of going on here, and especially the presence of this sort of a categorical theoretical ultra filter. So there are lots of interesting things, but the main problem is still the same. Do we have an equivalence of categories between a category and a more complex category, a kind of more topological category, and that would give you a kind of completeness theorem. So this is called Mackay's conceptual strong completeness theorem. On the one hand, you have a small pretopus that is like the category of your models. So it is like the Boolean algebra in the original category. And then uh, Mackay gives an equivalence of categories with some kind of complicated category that would be the more topological category, where the topology here is really controlled by the ultra functors. This is this fun alt, the ultra functors. And remember, those were these functors that we're, we were looking that were commuting with the integrals somehow between the, um, the, the models of C, the category of models of C, and set. So in a way, this is a huge generalization of our spec that we had before, but many of the ideas are kind of uh, uh, building on this. Uh, Lurie has, in 2019, Yet a more, uh, you know, a kind of elevated uh, version of this. But let me stress just the following uh, from you know conversation with him. So understanding the behavior of ultra functors seems to be fundamental. The language you started and writing today is part of this, and it generalizes all representation theorems. A key step of this consists in passing from sheaves to continuous sheaves, but this is anchored in ideas due to Grothendieck and Deligne. And also, according to Scholz, on constructions due to Bat and Scholz, uh, uh, according to, to Lurie, this is Lurie, constructions due to Bat and Scholz on pro, uh, pro et al. sheaves. Now, many categories have no products, but do have ultra products. That's, of course, very different from the description I was given here, but these uh, exist. And the, the construction depends on something called the categorical holes that allow to pin down the ultra products. An important example of this is categories of models of theories. These, I mean, you can take products of models of theories, but they're not useful in any more theoretical way, whereas ultra, you know, ultra products. So, so products are not useful. Ultra products are extremely useful. And let me, uh, yeah, close. I think I call it close with this. Lorin, personal communication claims to be searching for the natural logic of infinity categories through these completeness theorems. There is the following problem. Um, so a completeness theorem, in a way, can be seen as a 
So look at, you know, let us now take a step several decades back and let us look at non-standard models of arithmetic, for instance. Now, of course, many of the Gödelian phenomena already happen in that model. In the in the natural numbers, you have lots of, uh, you know, Gödel statements that uh, you cannot um, uh, really prove in a, in, a, in a reasonable system that are, however, true. But that sort of uh, unbalance is balanced by the completeness theorem once you allow to take the category of all models, when, when you start taking all models of, uh, of your theory, then you get some kind of symmetry can, or some kind of balance between models on the one hand and uh, the theory or syntax and semantics if you, if you want. So the completeness theorem in a way is responsible for the possibility uh, to infinite, yeah, Petrush yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Not infinity categories, but uh, two infinite categories. So there is this sort of a balance in model theory coming from uh, the completeness theorem, but the price to pay is that you have to look at uh, all possible models. But of course, we know that gives us all the enor enormous richness of model theory. Now, Lurie uh, seems to be concerned, at least he was concerned uh, on this at the end of 2019 when I spoke to him, that um, uh, in two infinite categories, there are standard models, there are well known, but there is no completeness theorem and there is no sense of how to build, in general, non-standard models. Some non-standard models have been constructed, of course, by, by some people, but there is no general way of rebalancing the information between standard models and non-standard models. And that is perhaps the reason why he started looking at this sort of a completeness through these tools. But let me uh, stop. Um, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, sharing here. Just presenting. There are some uh, questions in the chat, I think. Oh, where is it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, there are some additional questions. And I think this is the right moment to kind of uh, ponder our situation. So the completeness theorem was responsible for the huge development of, of model theory in part because of the balance it brings between syntax and semantics. Now, there are many model theoretic situations where this sort of balance is uh, is not there yet. You may have uh, interesting logics, you know, in both in the, you know, infinitary logics sense or in categorical logic sense, where the balance is not yet achieved. In a way, Mackay's theorem that I kind of very roughly described uh, is aiming at providing such a balance in categorical theoretical terms. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if uh, we want to now open the floor for uh, additional questions since now it is almost uh, well, three o'clock Colombia time, uh, five o'clock in, in, in Sao Paulo. So any other question? I have some questions in the chat. I, okay. So definition of categorical hull, Valeria. That's a long, long definition that I, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've been struggling to, to understand. The, the idea is, in a way, you, you kind of find a, a purely categorical way to bypass the construction in two steps, where you first take product, and then you take the, the co-limit, or the, the fibered co-limit of the product, and then you get the categorical neutral product. There are ways of doing that by essentially passing to well, there are some sheaves and what, they, what are called continuous sheaves in this work uh, inspired by Schultz, but uh, I cannot provide additional details. Sorry. But, but that, it, does it have anything to do with the geometry of hulls and stuff like that, convex hulls and, and stuff like that? Or yeah, not? yeah. In a, but in a, yes, the, the answer is yes, but um, uh, in, a, in a kind of a convoluted way. It goes to Schultz's definition. In the, so. It is convoluted. I think it is nice that there are categories where you have something that works like a neutral product, yet there are no products. I think that is because in a way that also what happens in model theory. I mean, model theory products are are not really models of the same theory. They're, they really fall off the category. Whereas if the products, as we know, are there all the time and uh, they are responsible for well for compactness phenomena and also for completeness phenomena as we see today. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'd like to offer a more detailed uh, answer to your question, Valeria. 
Right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm still a little bit confused, Andres. Kind of, can, I mean, can, can I ask more questions to see if I clarify the, the thing? I mean, yeah. I understand that the main point of the talk is to say that completeness brings balance, right? Yeah, that's that's a main point. That's a yeah, that's a you know like a bullet point of the of the talk. Completeness is some sort of balance. Why do we want this balance? Well, of course you could say I don't care. You could say I just have you know syntax here, semantics there, maybe a very poor semantics and very rich syntax, as happens in some situations, like in infinity categories or infinity infinity categories. There are very few models. But there is a huge uh, syntax even once and the syntax is as we know extremely useful for some problems and um, that is fine for a while uh, but model theory wants many models in model theory you want to have many non-standard versions of your own model you know in classical terms this was about true about uh, uh, arithmetic but now one could say well one would like to have this sort of situation also for, for uh, you know, in model theory, one does, you know, all the Tarski and so on work shows that for complex numbers and then for real numbers and much later for reals with uh, exponentiation, one can actually build sort of balanced theories in some sense. Um, in, in the more general situation where you have some infinitary logic or some logic come from uh, category theory, some topos logic, and so on. The balance is sometimes there, but it is more difficult to achieve. If there is no balance, then there is a danger always of uh, you know, having extremely well-developed syntax and, and extremely weak semantics that uh, may it may be problematic for some for some questions. Or maybe you have examples of the opposite: an extremely strong semantics, rich semantics, but very weak syntax. Maybe. I, I haven't thought too much about that sort of a imbalance. And um, the other thing that I wanted to bring about, I don't know if I succeeded, is we can look at, I mean, of course, we can look at very complicated logics, and we did that at the very end here. But in propositional logic, that seems, you know, like everybody knows propositional logic since high school or something. Like that. I mean, in some sense, we all do. It's like Venn diagrams of some sort. Once one starts taking seriously again some of the definitions and especially this stone duality, and one once uh, one starts playing with uh, the same definitions with different notation, there is a richness to, to be obtained. Like for instance, this sort of a integration through a measure, and uh, then what can, oh, can you iterate in different order, Fubini or? And um, in some cases, of course, we can. By the way, many set theoretical questions uh, in in, uh, in large cardinals can also be reframed in that way. People don't do that very often. It is not necessary most of the time, but uh, who knows? I mean, this may be useful in another in another sense. Now, this clearly leads into into geometrical ideas such as the ones you were asking about, Valeria. Very clearly, this goes in that. Direction, but this is because Lurie was, you know, driven by these sort of uh, geometric and uh, algebraic logical uh, questions. And uh, I only scratched at the surface of what he's doing. I'm not, you know, I, I didn't want to describe all what he's doing. I'm an algebraic topologist, but I want to see how this will be useful for us as moral theorists or category theorists. Right. Um you have another question on the on the chat <laughs> while oh, I'm yeah. thinking from Petrusio. Yeah. yeah, Petrusio has two infinite categories. That's um and then you answer... oh, okay, okay, yeah. When you prove a completeness theorem, it seems that the fact that the language is a free algebra plays some essential role in the proof. Is this feeling correct? Is it captured in your approach? Does you do you have a kind of generalization where freeness plays no role? Well that's well, what a question. I, I I think this is really going at the heart of what is going on here, uh, Patricia. The, this really, you know, um, I think the feeling, I also have that feeling that, uh, uh, you know, it seems that the language is, is a free algebra. And 
I don't have a counterexample to this, you know, like a basic situation where where this uh, uh, you know, show that this is incorrect. On the other hand, how is the approach? How does the approach capture this? Would be the more sophisticated question, like uh, how can one turn all of this approach into something that uh, that shows this? Um, I don't have a kind of generalization where freeness plays no role, unfortunately. Maybe somebody here, somebody or somebody in Brazil, uh, I mean, in this seminar may look at that direction. I think it's it's an extremely important direction, and uh, I welcome the question uh, because it it helps me kind of frame better what I was trying to, to convey here. And unfortunately, this is a sort of question that uh, here in a, I mean, in our logic group, people do a lot of interesting things, but not this sort of thing. This sort of question is ex extremely interesting to me. And uh, maybe in Brazil, there is more uh, of that. Do you have a, an idea about this, uh, Valeria or, or, or somebody else? Samuel, Brun. Well, I was going to say that I, I, I mean, I don't have any ideas on on that. I think that one of the things that's different, Andres, is that we have much more proof theory amongst us than model theory. So, you know, our model theory is a little bit defective at the moment. I have at least mine. You know, I don't know about everyone else, but I think in São Paulo, Hugo. I don't know if Hugo is present today or not, but they do more. Uh, and, and Marcelo, they, they do more model theory. I don't. But right. And yeah. people who don't do model theory don't kind of like uh, ultra filters as much as you do. So, <laughs> as we, you know, filters, yes. Pre sheaves, yes. Um, yeah. The completions but, are kind of a little bit um, not exactly the kinds of things that, that people like me like so much because they um, they have a little bit of a magic involved in them. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but, but what about this situation? Uh, so there is an additional situation that happens where you blend uh, sheaves and ultra filters by means of a generic model theorem. Like, uh, you know, McIntyre had some of that uh, in the early days. And then Caicedo here in Bogota developed a whole theory of that where you blend genericity and the, it's a genericity that, that generalizes set theoretical genericity, but also the wash phenomenon in a, not what, quite the wash theorem, but the wash phenomenon in this limit that uh, we're taking. And um, it is very rich. And, but, um, but it goes, I mean, it goes through the magic step that you mentioned, Valeria, because at some point you have to bring back some generic or bring back some ultra object or something. And that is kind of a, responsible for bringing in some kind of magic. On the other hand, and this may be connected to Petrusius' last question, um, maybe that part is necessary for a completeness theorem. Maybe there is no completeness theorem without some element of this sort of going to the limit. Maybe, you know, the, the freeness uh, of the algebra is, uh, is a difficult question, perhaps, but but, but there is clearly a kind of boundary between before taking limit and, or magic limit, if you want to call it that, that way, so you're in sheaves and pre-sheaves and so on, you don't have to take that magic limit, or you go to a generic, like we do when you do generic extension in, 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 in set theory, or a generic in the sense of sheaves, or ultra, you know, the wash phenomenon, and then you get all this sort of a completeness. So in a way, maybe another way to phrase all of this is uh, completeness and genericity have some sort of a you know parallel footing and in a way model theory the, at least the way uh, i think model theory is is, is done uh, uh, even i you know uh, model theory is very strong in first order i don't do so much first order model theory although uh, i interact uh, with the first order model theorists quite a lot but I am involved in bringing model theory to contexts where you have uh, much more general situations, more can, kind of categorically flavored, like abstract elementary classes or like large cardinal uh, situations. And even there, we are all the time on this side of that jump that Valeria mentions. So there is that kind of jump. 
and you very clearly said that you prefer to stay kind of on that on that side of the jump. I think that's a that's a very interesting uh, situation. Now, uh, one one can always ask, what information do you get about sheaves from their generic extension, uh, generic versions, or what information? is worth obtaining through this sort of completeness phenomenon. You're muted, uh, Valeria, I think. I cannot hear you. Yeah, no, I, I, I sorry, yeah. I mean, oh. I was trying to kind of keep myself from saying too much, <laughs> but uh, because I think there is this other uh, worry that I have, which is that, you know, I want to see everything kind of transformed into category theory, as you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and hence one of the things that people are discussing quite a bit more recently is how to do measure theory and probability theory using category theory. And we don't know how to do it properly yet. You know, we, we have attempts and as far as I know, none of them works terribly well. So kind of, you know, maybe, maybe we should kind of learn a bit more from the model theorists to see, you know, if our attempts at doing, um, measure theory kind of categorically if they are kind of tallying with your results along those lines because you know i was very kind of shocked to see this this integrals happening here kind of uh, they it's shocking yeah at first it is very really shocking you know when i started looking at Lurie's paper i was fascinated and uh, at the same time kind of uh, you know scared a little bit but and then um i was visiting uh Schellach in um in Rutgers, and then I start. Uh, I went to the institute. It was kind of a short, like mini, uh, five-day visit. Uh, the and and he was there. I just started, you know, kind of. He's a very shy person. You know, Lori is extremely shy and kind of a yes, no answer to most of your questions. But at some point, he kind of uh, opened in the direction of uh, kind of letting see why he was doing these things, and it clarified a lot of things. Now about doing uh, measure theory or probability theory, maybe taking a look at uh, all this development of uh, uh, Kiesler, very recent Kiesler uh, logics or um, kind of blending measure theory, you know, continuous logic, but not only continuous, but kind of blending continuous and discontinuous. Uh, it, it's a very interesting uh, model theory. This is from 2018 or something like that. I mean, Kiesler, is still producing after all these years, and things go back to maybe you know the uh, the 1960s in his own work, and he has results where now a model might have some part that is continuous, where you have a lot of some part that is discontinuous, and you want to still take measures of that, and you build a kind of logic for that model, model theory in the traditional sense. That is far away from category theory, but who knows? It may blend in a in a natural way. I don't know. But, but, uh, or maybe you have to go more directly categoric, theoretical. I, I have no idea. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, it's very lots of things to think from a wonderful talk lots of, of interesting ideas to to think but you know also kind of shows the ignorance of some of us <laughs> well, well, i think it, yeah mathematics is it's, it's huge yeah, i mean uh, yeah. and, uh, we'll try you know, a little bit then but uh, i i thought this was a nice place to bring all this kind of blend of of different things that uh might trigger something interesting at some point. Thank you very much. No, thank you very thank you much. Very much. <laughs> we haven't clapped yet, have we? <laughs> thank uh, you. Thank you. And thank you for your question.